Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at adrenaline and secondary messengers for your A-level biology. Now Dr. Fred Blizz is going to take you through everything here, where the hormones start, where they go, what they do and then what effect that they have. And then once you've got to the end of this video, making careful notes, what I want you to do is to jump down to the description, look for the quiz that we've made you over on my website to test that you understood everything you've been taught in this lesson. Okay, so we've looked at how the hormones that we've talked about, so insulin and glucagon so far, how they bring about change in blood glucose. But we haven't actually gone into detail about how they actually cause those changes to happen in the cell. And I mentioned in the previous video that those hormones can't actually go into the cells and make change. And what they have to do is they have to signal another chemical inside the cell to take over and pass on that message. So we're going to have a look at adrenaline, which is another hormone that we need to know about that does this as well. And look at these two and decide how they actually cause this secondary messenger cycle. So first things first is why can't they cross the cell membrane? So some hormones are what we call non-steroid hormones. So they're not made of similar molecules to the cell membrane. They're made of proteins. And we should know by now that hopefully most proteins are too large or they, they are unable to cross through that phospholipid bilayer because they're not lipid soluble. So remember anything that is charged, so that includes polar molecules with the exception of water because it is small, and anything that is not lipid soluble or fat soluble means that it can't just diffuse through that plasma membrane, or if it's too large as well, obviously. So some hormones are non-steroid hormones, so they're protein based, and so they haven't got this ability to move through the cell membrane. This means they have to bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell membrane and rely on what we call secondary messengers to work inside the cells to amplify that original signal and cause the change to happen within the cell. So we're going to look at two hormones, glucagon and adrenaline. Obviously, we've seen glucagon and spoke about glucagon before. So it is being released by the alpha cells, which are in the islands of Langerhans, which are based in the pancreas. The other one we need to look at is adrenaline. So adrenaline is secreted by the adrenal glands, which are found on top of your kidney. So you have one gland on the top of each kidney and they secrete the hormone adrenaline. You've probably come across adrenaline before, previously spoke about potentially at GCSC, looking at the fight or flight response, or looking at the fact that it can, it can increase things like heart rate. But we're going to look at it today in the context of how it plays a role in our management of blood glucose levels. Okay, so we're looking at both of these hormones because they trigger the activation of glycogenolysis in liver cells, and it occurs through this secondary messenger model that we've mentioned. So both adrenaline or glucagon can do this. They bind to their receptors on the cell membrane of liver cells, and these are classed as the first messengers. So non-steroid hormones, hormones that have to bind to receptors on the outside of cells, are classed as the first messenger. The adrenaline and glucagon have both been secreted as a response to low blood glucose levels in this case, and their aim is obviously to try and cause a change in the liver cells that's going to release glucose into the blood. So the first thing that happens when they bind to their receptors is that it triggers the activation of something called a G protein. So we're going to take the G protein and activate it. Normally, remember when we talk about activation, we tend to mean adding a phosphate group, which is something uh, one of those other uses of ATP is to be able to add a phosphate group to a molecule and it tends to activate it or increase its energy level. That activated G protein then causes a shape change in an enzyme that's bound inside the membrane called adenylcyclase. It's an enzyme, and so this conformational shape change that happens when the G protein binds to it makes it able to be activated. So it changes the shape in order for it to now accept its substrate and be able to catalyze a reaction. The adenylcyclase enzyme, when it's activated, can catalyze the conversion of ATP into something called cyclic AMP, or CAMP for short. And this is then the secondary messenger. So this activation of ATP into CAMP, the CAMP is what then goes on to cause the changes in the cell that we want to happen. So it's the secondary messenger. It passes on this signal and causes the change in the cell. So what CAMP does is it activates a protein kinase enzyme cascade. So protein kinase enzymes are 
a group of enzymes. And this idea of a cascade is that one enzyme is activated, which causes something to happen, which triggers another enzyme, etc. And ultimately, this leads to the breakdown of glycogen into glucose or glycogen lysis. And so therefore, we're going to release glucose into the bloodstream. So that binding of the adrenaline or the glucagon through this system has triggered change in the cell, which has resulted in the outcome that we wanted as the effector causes the response of increasing the blood glucose level. So this is a very similar system used by a lot of hormones that have to bind to receptors. It's similar, depending on obviously the target cell, it will have different effects based on what this enzyme cascade sets off. But this is something that's quite common in cells in biology as a way of triggering an effect inside a cell from the outside by being, only being able to bind to a receptor. This one, two, three, four, five points is the kind of thing you might need to write and say a long answer question describing how a secondary messenger might cause a, a change in a cell. Or, for example, if it asks how adrenaline or glucagon actually leads to liver cells producing more glucose or releasing glucose, this is the type of thing you would say. There are some other actions of adrenaline that are relevant to our blood glucose concentration. So adrenaline is secreted when there's low blood glucose levels, as we've just said, but also when you're stressed. So when you're in fight or flight mode or when you are exercising, as both of these will require you to need more glucose in your muscles for respiration so that you can move quickly and run away or fight. Um, or if you're just exercising, you're going to need more um, glucose there ready to do respiration so that you can move your muscles for running or whatever. So this makes sense that it has these actions. So it works, as we've just said, by triggering glycogenolysis in liver cells, but it has some other actions as well. It activates glycogenolysis, but it also inhibits the conversion of glucose to glycogen in the liver. So that makes sense because you want to be trying to making sure that you are releasing a load of glucose. You don't want to start doing the conversion back to glycogen at any point until the blood glucose levels have returned to what you want them to be. So adrenaline is not one of these that demonstrates negative feedback. Adrenaline is either released and is in the bloodstream or it is not. So it has the effect when it's there and then when it's gone, it stops. So while the adrenaline is in the bloodstream, these changes will happen. And then when it stops, it stops. So whilst adrenaline's in the system, glycogenolysis is obviously going to be happening and triggered. And then when the conversion of glucose to glycogen is stopped, but when adrenaline drops away and if the blood glucose levels return to normal or they go too high again, then the conversion of glucose to glycogen will restart. It also stimulates glycogenolysis in muscle cells. So muscle cells also have a store of glycogen. Hopefully we know this and that glycogen can be broken down to release glucose when necessary for respiration. And so the binding of adrenaline to receptors on the muscle cells has a similar effect to what we just spoke about with the liver cells. And it causes glycogen to be broken down to release the glucose. And then the glucose is there in the cells. It stays there. It's not released into the blood. It stays there because that's where it's needed to be able to carry out respiration. So as well as causing these changes in the liver and the muscle cells, which we'd expect when we're looking at trying to control blood glucose levels, what adrenaline also does is it goes to the source. So it actually goes to the pancreas and causes changes there that affect blood glucose concentration. So what it does is it activates glucagon secretion in alpha cells and it inhibits beta cells from producing insulin to make sure that our blood glucose levels are going to increase so that there is enough glucose in the blood to get to your muscles and to get to the other organs that you need in order for fight or flight or exercise depending on which situation we're in. And those three actions are kind of other actions of adrenaline that are linked to adrenaline's hormonal response to things like stress or exercise, but they're directly related to how we control our blood glucose levels. And in most of the ways, they're going to have this secondary messenger effect, which is how the adrenaline is actually going to cause those changes in these cells. Ouch! This is when somebody is either explained scratches. <laughs>